Thank you everyone for inviting uh, my team to give a case presentation. Uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, I actually don't work for Pennsylvania Department of Health. I work at Health Promotion Council. We are a nonprofit part of the larger Public Health Management Corporation. Uh, but Health Promotion Council is its own nonprofit, and we are one of the Pennsylvania Department of Health regional primary contractors for the state's tobacco control program. So Health Promotion Council is in, is in charge of tobacco dependence treatment, policy, prevention, multi and housing, enforcement, anything under the sun tobacco control related, we, we cover for the seven counties around Philadelphia County. And that includes Lancaster County. So when um, Lancaster City Housing, Lancaster Health Center, and the Department of Health were asked to join up on this project, um, Department of Health pivoted towards myself and, and the rest of the folks here at HPC's tobacco control team, uh, just to lend some additional insights. Uh, we've been working with, the, with uh, some folks in Lancaster for a while. Uh, we have a tight, tight partnership with the quit line, and so they just felt like it would be good to bring us in on this project just to sort of um, informally provide technical assistance and, and insights and help add some uh, robustness to the relationships and, and that sort of thing. So. Uh, thanks again for allowing me to present a case. Uh, this is not a traditional case presentation in that we don't have one particular patient that I would like to discuss. Um, and actually this is outside of the venue or setting of the multi-unit housing residents and health centers. Um, so thanks again kind of for everybody letting me sort of take us off in a little different direction here. But um, basically what I would like to present here is a program at a youth substance use disorder treatment center. Um, it's called The Bridge. It's part of the Public Health Management Corporation. And The Bridge uh, IOP program is funded by SAMHSA. And we were pulled in to provide one hour of week, one hour per week of uh, psychoeducation and health education services for participants in this intensive outpatient program. And so the youth that are in the program have, it's mostly opioid use disorder, but they have uh, also histories of marijuana, alcohol, uh, other substances. Some of them are court ordered, some of them are not. Um, and so per the requirements of the grant, which I did not write, but I was you know, asked to step in and help uh, create a program and provide technical assistance, um, we were tasked with as uh, formally as possible, integrating tobacco dependence treatment and youth empowerment programming into this uh, youth IOP substance use treatment program. So as you can see, the diagnosis are sort of varied. It's, it's mostly substance abuse issues. I'm sure that some of the youth have uh, mental health diagnoses. Uh, they're all actually pretty high functioning. Um, Let's see, so in terms of their medications, it's hard to tell as just a facilitator running a group. Uh, we don't have full access to their uh, case files and all that, but their case managers do join us for the one hour where we're doing, it's not really treatment, but we're, we're trying to get it as close to providing tobacco dependence treatment as we can. Um, so as you look down at the tobacco use and the current tobacco use, out of the six participants or so right now, there are none of them that, that smoke uh, commercial cigarettes. And then there's some that vape, that use different e-cig devices. There's some that smoke mini cigars. There's some that smoke full-size cigars. Um, there are some that vape nicotine and THC products. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, Despite being screened at intake for tobacco use and all of these different devices, there's no biometric or no bio verification. Um, so most of them say that they don't use tobacco and that they don't use nicotine products. And so then that goes in their chart that they don't and that then fails to trigger a tobacco dependence treatment plan. Um, and then later we'll find out, you know, we'll see a youth with a device in their pocket uh, someone passes one device to another person in the group or a case manager sees them vaping on the basketball court around the corner after group is over. So even though they've told the professional at intake and us that they don't vape, they don't use nicotine products, they don't use any tobacco products, even after 
education about what is a tobacco product, what is nicotine, which of these products contain nicotine. They understand what we're asking and they just don't tell the truth. So that makes it, you know, tricky. And uh, maybe I'll ask you all for some feedback on that. But I guess for now, let's keep moving through the case. Uh, in terms of the cessation medications, none of them have used any of those things. Maybe there's one youth that tried the lozenger, the gum one time, but no one has really tried to make a serious behavior change and no one's been prescribed any of this stuff. No one's had their parents get it, get it for them or them buy it for themselves over the counter or anything like that. Uh, so no medications, no NRT as of yet. Uh, counseling strategies, uh, the way it was designed is that we were supposed to do this sort of awkward combination of tobacco dependence treatment and youth empowerment. Um, and in a way that kind of works well. Uh, I think every, many of the folks on the call understand that youth may not respond to the same sorts of messages that an older patient might, such as the health consequences. And so we focused a little bit more on making sure that the participants, the youth participants understand tobacco products, understand the industry, understand how cigarettes were designed to be the maximally addictive device that they can be and how the same industry or same industries have used many of the same strategies to design a high-end device that can deliver large doses of nicotine and to pair that with messages like, these are healthier, these are safer, uh, sex sells, this is about freedom, all those sorts of messages. And despite us, you know, trying to lift the veil on the industry, they're, they're not responding too much. They see themselves as just tough. They're going to do whatever they want. And, you know, they don't think it's that dangerous. So uh, I can talk more if anybody has questions about the types of activities in terms of skill building and empowerment. Um, but I guess we could keep moving down. So uh, I gave you the background there about the program requirements in terms of screening. And let's see, so what do we, let's see, what is the system or workflow that we're trying to create? We could have a better system of referring out um, once they're outside of the IOP program. Um, but the big one is that second line there, promoting consistency and treatment planning and actually helping youth move through the steps of their plan. And actually, you know, if they say, all right, I will, call my friend instead of vape in the morning, or I will go skateboard or go play basketball instead of vape in the morning. Just some, even one concrete step, um, you know, they won't, they don't agree to making that change because they don't admit to the behavior that needs changing in the first place. So we're, uh, we're struggling with consistency and getting treatments in the books. Uh, we're struggling to get them to admit to use. We're struggling to then get them to take steps towards any treatment plan. Uh, let's see, what's next there? Uh, how it's currently working, I think I, des I described that, but basically it's, it's one or two facilitators that, are, that come from our office, tobacco treatment specialists, or the one other person that we send that's not a tobacco treatment specialist is a youth intervention specialist. So we thought between tobacco treatment specialists and someone who specializes in working with vulnerable and, and at-risk youth, we figured we would make some progress, but it's been, it's been slow and difficult. Um, what our vision for this would look like if it was working better. Uh, if it was me, I would put in a urine or hair screen for nicotine right off the bat. They're screened for opioids, they're screened for marijuana when they come in. I have no idea why I can't get leadership to agree to this. Um, I'm gonna keep pushing for it and uh, they seem to think that the screen at intake, they're getting honesty at that point. And so maybe we'll revisit that and, and pressure the case managers to help deploy the tobacco dependence treatment plan one, once it's been entered into, the, into their record. But there's a couple steps in between there. And I think the, the bio verification would, would, would potentially help. Um, there's been some question from this site and as well as some schools about how do we assess uh, the degree to which some of these youth are actually dependent or addicted. Um, how do we determine whether or not they need treatment or not? Um, one approach for us has just been, if they're using it all, send them to a specialist and help them develop a plan. Um, and then on the back end, it's, you know, that's all well and good, but maybe we would still like to have some kind of scale. Um, it's not 
been validated. We haven't even used it yet, but I did take the FTND and uh, sort of pick apart a couple of questions, replace smoking or cigarettes with vaping, and um, added a little color code system for schools that if you know they tick any of these boxes, then they're definitely, if they vape within five minutes of waking up, no question about it, that youth is gonna need full treatment rather than maybe you know a two hour alternative suspension program or something, they're gonna need something more intensive. Um, so we're working on a couple tools like that to see if we can help make it more clear that this person really does need help and it's up to us now to step in and, and help them create and execute a plan. Uh, have there been any changes in the last six months? Yes, I think the participants are more regularly screened and are asked if they want assistance uh, changing their smoking and tobacco use behaviors. Uh, but like I said, they may even admit to it in the beginning and then later they'll say, no, I don't do that. Um, in terms of the data collected, you can see there, uh, GIPRA is required by SAMHSA. And then we also have, uh, there's some questions. Thankfully, that even if none of them completely change, completely stop, there's a question, how motivated are you to reduce or change your nicotine and tobacco use? So even if they are, come into the program not at all likely and they move up to a three out of 10 being somewhat likely, you know, we've made a little bit of progress at least in the eyes of the funder. Uh, is that it? Is that the last box or anything below that? I don't think so. Um, I'm happy to answer questions or take questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Sean. Um, and I would just say, I need to apologize for joining in on like a tangentially related thing. This is so relevant and applicable to both, I think, all the work that everyone's doing out there, but then clearly across the country. So I um, appreciate you bringing this topic to the group for some discussion. Um, I have one clarifying question that I saw in the chat box from Christine around, um, can you tell us the ages of the youth that are in your program, like a range? Yeah, right now I think they're 13 to 18. Okay, cool. Uh, that's helpful. And then I think Christine had another clarifying question about, it, and it sounded like what you were describing that if the youth are seen using any kind of end products that they are sometimes referred into the group. So there is some effort at um, the e-cigarettes and vaping products also being a part of the cessation effort, not just combustible tobacco. Do we understand that right? Yep. They, okay, great. No one can really be referred into the program. It's if they are court ordered or the parents are having them join this intensive outpatient program. This program within all of the bridge program is the only one that requires tobacco dependence treatment be integrated in this way. Gotcha, gotcha. Great, thanks. Okay, any other clarifying questions from anybody? Uh, and it looks like um, Steve has a great question. So Sean, Steve's asking, um, has the issue of any lung injury from the vaping devices, especially around all the recent deaths come up in the group? Yeah, yeah, just a couple weeks ago, we spent the whole hour just on vaping, just on the health consequences. Uh, they don't believe it. You know, some of these youth are blatantly just, you can take any pill. If you take enough of it, you can get high. And they just, you know, that you could throw them all any study you want. You could show them Surgeon General. You could show them pictures of the kid in the hospital. You can show them, you know, they don't, they just, they're young. So they, they, they want to push back. Um, yeah. Invincible. They have an invincible That's uh, illusion. To, to talking about the industry and the tactics and how this is really the opposite of freedom and they're just using you and they don't seem to respond too much to that either. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, great. Well, this is all super, I think everyone's, I see a lot of nods and I suspect everyone who's even not on video is also nodding, like re resonating with the challenges you're describing. So let's open it up to our faculty for Ideas, suggestions, recommendations, any more dis in discussion um, for Sean? Sean, this is Frank. Um, what I found the most effective is kind of a variation of what you just said, and that is to specifically use the word manipulated. You are being manipulated by the tobacco companies who need 3,000 new smokers every day to start because they're, use they're losing 3,000 people are dying using this, these products. Now this is specifically to cigarettes, but you, know, you can extrapolate from that. Um, they need your body. That, 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 that I found that that was an effective um, 
uh, language to use, that they need your body, they're manipulating you, and all they care about um, is getting you hooked. So again, you, if you, it seems like you may have already tried that, but I, maybe that specific language might help. And number two, when you're screening them, I simply ask, when is the last time you used nicotine? So if nobody's ever used it or smoked, they'll just say that. But I think you're going to capture more people who um, grab that way than if you say, do you use, do you smoke or use any other kind of nicotine products? Because that kind of then gets them uh, to say, oh, well, maybe I used it a couple weeks ago or I used it, um, uh, you know, yesterday, whereas they may not be daily smokers, so they may not consider themselves to be smokers. Um, we found that to be a big issue, is that if you're not doing it daily, um, then you are, that many people in their own minds don't consider themselves smokers. And I would take everybody, because the, the um, Steve will back this up. Uh, we, we did a big conference in PA, and, they've, and the leadership center has done this all over the country. We know very clearly that if you quit using tobacco or nicotine, you are much more likely to stay sober and uh, away from any whatever substance you're using. And you're also more likely, if there's a psychiatric diagnosis, to um, um, be, you know, stay um, out of a relapse. So there's plenty, plenty, plenty of data for your, for your staff. I don't know, again, that it would be worthwhile sharing the data with them, but we do know that. So if they're serious about getting off of one substance, we know that this would, that there's a, a higher chance that they will stay uh, clean if, they, if they're not using uh, tobacco. Thank you. Helpful. Thanks, thanks, Frank. Um, I love that. When did you last use tobacco or nicotine? Um, is help. I think that's really helpful. I found that with patients too. If I say the when question versus the do you, I get a lot more truthful answers about lots of things. Um, that's super helpful. Um, Steve or Amy or anybody else have thoughts? I see Amy came up. You go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I can add a couple of thoughts. That's. A lot of challenges. I know how challenging that can be. Um, so obviously just sticking with that. I like how um, Frank had mentioned if you quit nicotine, that gives them a 25% better chance of staying off all of other substances. So if that's important to them, try to build off that. I think MI approaches are going to be important to, to use to find out what, what are those reasons that are important to them. Is it their health? Is it um, that they're really used tobacco companies? Um, just kind of to explore their beliefs about smoking or vaping, explore their beliefs about quitting, find out again what motivates them. Um, really that autonomy is the most important thing and you want it to come from them. So even if you're not thinking about quitting, thinking about cutting back, you know, don't really care just to try to develop discrepancies. Um, and again, the important thing is, you know, they need to get off um, the opioids that they're using. They need to fully recover from that. Um, how to then weave using nicotine in that and how to be much more successful if they um, are quitting both. I also wanted to mention if um, they might be interested in using other resources. So um, the Truth Initiative has a mobile app for youth, um, I think 13 and older, this is quitting. Um, National Cancer Institute has a Quit Star mobile app. Um, and there's also like the Smoke Free Text um, for Teens app and texting programs. So maybe just, again, trying to, to get other um, ways to get information out and providing them with something that they can, you know, that they do all the time, texting and sitting on their phone and app. So, yeah, giving them some other options or resources too could be helpful. That's great. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, that's super helpful too. Um, thanks. Yeah, we're doing a lot of that stuff, uh, but this is very helpful. The other thing that we tried that I forgot to mention was, um, I used a little slip of paper at one point to just have them, if they wanted to sit down outside of the group and so they wouldn't have to admit, admit to anybody else that they wanted to change their behavior, that they, there was a route for them to say, yes, I want help and no one else knows that they asked for it. Um, but we didn't get any bites on that. So. 
So this is Steve. You've done a great job, Sean, in trying to cover all the bases. The only thing I didn't hear is money. You might want to ask, particularly the folks who are using it fairly frequently, to just do a back of the envelope calculation, figure out how much they're spending, and then do some idea generation of what else they could buy with the money they're using for the vaping. That's great, Steve. Let me let me not to be combative, but one of the youth, unfortunately, we think is selling vape and jewel products and that sort of thing. So he's paying for his own habit by selling stuff on the black market. So yeah, yeah that's probably not the only thing that they're selling too, right? Yeah, yeah. No, they're they're a tough group. They're they're smart kids. They're just tough. So thank you, everybody. Anything else? Very helpful. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much. This is really, like I said, relevant, and you're doing really great work. Hard work, um, but great work. The one thing I'm sure you picked up on this, but I was listening to what the statistics that Frank and Amy were sharing. I just wanted to highlight um, for your leadership, as far as like getting you some more support to like screen for nicotine metabolites and things, and as the intake, that some of that data might help convince your leadership to to put some more resources into this. Um, effort to help people quit their nicotine habit as well. So I just wanted to make thought about that as leadership cares about stuff like that. And that would help your grant deliverables as well as helping a lot of people. 